I'm Harriet Vance Ball, Associate Professor of Medicine and Cardiologist at McMaster University, and I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Dr. Eugene Braunwald, one of the most well-known cardiologists and clinical trialists of our era. He is Distinguished Hersey Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School and the founding chairman of the Timmy Study Group. Welcome, Dr. Braunwald. Thank you. Nice to be with you. You were the senior investigator of the Paradise MI trial presented at ACC 2021. And we are here to discuss the methodology and the findings of this trial. May I invite you to tell us about the context and the study hypotheses? Yes. Well, as, um, as you know, uh, the um, Paradigm Heart Failure Trial was a landmark trial that uh, uh, was presented uh, in Barcelona uh, in 2015. And it was a um, uh, really a very, very important trial uh, that showed uh, a marked improvement in heart failure patients. Ambulatory patients, uh, New York Heart Association class two or three, very large trial, and um, the results were unequivocally positive uh, with reductions not only in heart failure hospitalization, but also in total mortality, which is rare that we see that. Um, and, um, uh, and the drug has uh, done quite well. Uh, Sacubitril valsartan has done quite well, but um, uh, we and others are exploring how far does it go because these were ambulatory patients uh, in class two and three. And um, um, uh, none of them were unstable. They were, uh, none of them had the recent myocardial infarction. Um, uh, and um, uh, was it all heart failure uh, or was it specific to the group that was first studied? So one of these trials was the Paradise Heart Failure Trial and my close colleague of uh, many years, Mark Pfeffer, was the principal investigator of that trial. And the goal of the trial was to study patients with acute myocardial infarction who were not in heart failure but who had some left ventricular dysfunction. So they were patients who might go into heart failure. Um, and they were of, um, uh, we selected patients who, uh, with moderate advanced uh, MI. And I'll show you the uh, characteristics. Um, so the patients uh, were between a half day or seven days um, after admission for myocardial infarction. The average was four days. And uh, they had to have either a moderately reduced ejection fraction under 40% or pulmonary congestion, uh, but not pulmonary edema. So it's a medium group, plus one other risk enhancer. And the risk enhancers are shown here on uh, uh, the slide. There are eight of them. I won't go into all of them, but you see uh, the, the logical ones, uh, advanced age over 70, diabetes, and so forth. So these are uh, moderately advanced uh, uh, MI patients. There were three major exclusions. Prior heart failure, as if they were prior heart failure, then they would fall into the category of patients that uh, uh, might have been seen in paradigm. Clinical instability um, and uh, a uh, low um, uh, GFR of 30. Now the trial uh, had no run-in period. It was a double-blind active control trial in which the comparator was Ramipril uh, with a target dose of five milligrams uh, twice a day. And I might say that ramipril is the most widely used uh, ACE inhibitor um, in uh, 
uh, postmyocardial infarction in the world today. But they're all very similar. Uh, against the Cucutril Valsartan, and the target dose was um, uh, 200 milligrams BID. And uh, the yeah, trial was event driven, uh, looking for 711 primary events. The median follow up was 23 months. And the primary endpoint was the usual one in these kinds of trials, cardiovascular death, heart failure hospitalization, or outpatient development of heart failure, uh, any one of these. Um, and the first one, the secondary endpoints were CV death or first heart failure hospitalization. So who were these patients? Well, um, as you might expect, uh, they were uh, uh, in their mid 60s. Um, a quarter of them were female. Uh, we excluded prior heart failure. Uh, one out of six had a previous MI. Um, most of them were hypertensive, the history of hypertension. 43% uh, had a history of diabetes and um, uh, they are GFR uh, since it couldn't be below uh, 60. Um, below 30 uh, uh, averaged uh, 72. Right, so, so a risk-enriched uh, population designed to give you the events in this event-driven trial. Yes. A different population than paradigm and unlike paradigm, no run and phase, yes. but similar to paradigm and event-driven trial. Wonderful. Yes, I think that's exactly correct. So, um, so once they came into the trial, uh, uh, who were these? Well, um, about three quarters had a STEMI and, and a quarter had NSTEMI. Now, they, this is uh, important. Uh, 89% had been reperfused during those four days between admission to the hospital and uh, um, uh, randomization in the trial. Um, as you can see, these 68% um, uh, were anterior MIs. The time to randomization, I said, was four days. The uh, ejection fraction was 36%. Um, a little more than half were killer class uh, two or greater. And uh, they were on, they were well treated with dual antiplatelet therapy, uh, beta blockers. 94% um, were on statins and 78% um, had received an ACE ARP before at the time of a preceding randomization. Then they were placed on one or the other, the two drugs. I wonder what your thoughts are on the uptake of MRAs in this patient population, given the um, trial evidence for mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists in the post-MI setting, particularly when LV ejection fraction is reduced. Yeah, there we go, 40%. Mm -hmm. I think that's, um, um, I think that that is the practice around the world. This is a global trial that involved mm -hmm. 40 countries. Somewhat suboptimal, but balanced between the groups. Yes, mm -hmm. that, that's right. So yeah, it is interesting to see what these patients, how they are managed mm -hmm. uh, by their physicians. And uh, uh, I was impressed with the statins and the very high frequency of uh, uh, reperfusion. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, that will reflect itself when you see the, the, the results. Right, Next a real day. marker of how much practice has changed compared to the ACE inhibitor trials, right? Such yeah. a high uh, uptake of primary reperfusion versus yes. thrombolytic therapy. Yes, and here is the primary outcome of the trial. So this is uh, to repeat uh, the uh, primary outcome was CV death, first hospitalization or outpatient heart failure. Um, and uh, 
the um, Ramaprilla shown in blue. Uh, the Sucubatril valsartan is shown in red. Um, you see they are, uh, as you might expect, the uh, curve rises rapidly in these early days, first month after myocardial function, and then they um, uh, 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 continue to, to rise but at a steady rate. So, um, uh, the hazard ratio, there was a 10% reduction, which uh, uh, was not statistically significant. So we have to say that the um, uh, uh, hypothesis going in was not met. Uh, the trial in a conservative uh, fashion um, uh, uh, did not show a benefit um, in the pre-specified primary endpoint. Oh. Right, and what strikes me from this slide is that you came close to the um, number of events that you have yes. aimed for, but markedly fewer events uh, than in the paradigm trial. I believe from my recollection, yes. there were more than 2000 primary events in yes. the paradigm trial versus around 700 yes. in this one. Uh, I, I think the trial was underpowered mm -hmm. uh, in retrospect. If we'd had gone longer or if we'd had enrolled more patients, uh, but sometimes uh, the sponsors uh, make uh, that kind of decision. The, the risk uh, strata of the patients were similar. You had similar annualized event rates, but perhaps with a longer follow-up, you would have accrued yes. more events and had uh, greater exactly. But, but But there's some additional information that... Uh, uh, that you'll find interesting, I think. We think it's important to look at total events. In other words, if, if a patient has uh, three hospitalizations for heart failure, they use up many more um, resources and they're ill and they have multiple hospitalizations uh, as opposed to just simply a, a single event. If a patient uh, uh, in, in the usual way of analysis, which I showed you on the previous slide, um, if a patient has a hospitalization and then uh, uh, dies, that's mm -hmm. only shown as a hospitalization. It's not shown because it's the first event. So if we look at total events, first and recurrent, you see there is a, um, um, a sharper difference um, a 21% um, a, uh, reduction, which is uh, statistically significant. So to summarize, we consider these to have been vigorously managed patients, and we call them enhanced risk acute MI. Um, and uh, uh, the comparison was made uh, with um, an excellent uh, ACE inhibitor. Sucubitril valsartan did not result in a significantly lower rate of cardiovascular death, heart failure hospitalization, or outpatient heart failure requiring treatment. Pre-specified observations, and I emphasize the word pre-specified, of reductions in both the investigator reports of the primary outcome, as well as in the total recurrent adjudicated events support incremental clinical benefit of Sucubitril valsartan. The safety and tolerability of Sucubitril valsartan in this M AMI population was comparable to that of the ACE inhibitor. So the, here's a comparison of what's been happening with MI patients in the 1990s to, to 2021. So, we're talking about what's happened in 30 years. Mm -hmm. So the top two slides are the um, uh, ACE inhibitor slides. Uh, Mark Pfeffer and I uh, co uh, had the uh, SAVE trial, and then there's air and trace, and there's a meta-analysis of the three, and you can see that uh, the benefit that was seen with the ACE inhibitor compared to placebo but please also note that the um, incidence 
of mortality uh, in the placebo group was uh, 33%. And um, it was uh, significantly reduced uh, with the ACE inhibitor. I'm not going to say much about the Valsartan um, uh, right now because of time. But then let's go to the bottom of the slide and you see the trial that we just talked about. So you see the rabbit girl, Sucubitril Valsartan. And you see that the mortality, the three-year mortality, is down to 10%. So it has declined by 75%. Now, it's much tougher to show uh, a benefit when patients are doing well. It was easy in the 1990s. Uh, but now with all of the changes, positive changes that have occurred in the treatment of myocardial infarction, uh, there is less heart failure and less. Uh, uh, so it's tougher to find the benefit of subcubitral valsartan, but I am convinced that it's there. Right. As background therapies have changed and invasive interventions have uh, been afforded to more patients in our healthcare systems across the world, outcomes have improved, event rates have uh, become reduced, and it is harder to show incremental benefits with new pharmacotherapies. Um, you did achieve the event that you had planned for, you showed a numeric reduction in your composite endpoint, but it did not achieve statistical significance. Tell us how these findings, along with those of the LIFE trial that was also presented, add information to our understanding of neprilysin inhibition in the spectrum of heart failure care. Well, I think that um, there is um, uh, no dispute about patients, ambulatory patients uh, with chronic heart failure in class two or three New York Heart Association. I think that that is uh, well established. Although it is important to point out that this landmark trial, the Paradigm Heart Failure Trial, really excluded patients who didn't tolerate the drug. They had a long running period of, uh, of both the uh, uh, ACE inhibitor and especially of, um, of sacubitril valsartan. I think the sacubitril valsartan was uh, uh, six weeks and, uh, and therefore uh, it was known that these patients could tolerate it. In this particular population, we went in um, uh, blindly, so to speak. Uh, there was no run-in. Right, and that, more reflective of real-world care. Yes. Right? Yeah, absolutely. So, so, so would you do it any different if you had to redesign the study? Well, if we had to redesign the study, I think that uh, we would have um, insisted on um, uh, that, that uh, 700 events uh, would in the present day uh, would be insufficient to show a benefit since we're at such a low level uh, in the uh, REM program, since we would be at such a low level. You could also change your primary endpoint from time to first event to number of events. Uh, potentially you would have had more events to oh, analyze. It, it, as it you would should. have been, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So we had, a, we had several things working against us so in a formal sort of legalistic way, uh, mm -hmm. the trial was negative. But as a physician, I'm looking at these patients and I'm looking at the numbers that show a benefit. And if a patient uh, uh, dies after having previously been hospitalized, that death should be recorded. Mm -hmm. It should be part of an endpoint, and it was part of an endpoint when you look at the total endpoints. Right. But, so, uh, at, for as a clinician, the way I would interpret this trial is that in healthcare systems that have access to sacubitril valsartan uh, and 
can provide this therapy in the inpatient setting, your trial yeah. demonstrated safety, despite the higher incidence of hypotension in the uh, Sacubitril of Alsartan group, it didn't translate to any clinically relevant uh, events. Yeah. And in fact, you showed a numeric reduction in clinically important endpoints. So you've demonstrated safety. And as long as there's access affordability and the patient can continue on with this therapy in the outpatient setting, it is one among many interventions that can be considered um, in the post-MI setting. Tell us how this differs from your findings of the LIFE trial in advanced heart failure. Yeah, well, I think that um, uh, the LIFE trial um, was in patients who had experienced uh, patients with chronic heart failure. So we're talking about a totally different population. This mm -hmm. is acute MI. These are patients in, in chronic heart failure mm -hmm. who had been hospitalized. They were in and out of the hospital. Mm -hmm. uh, the majority had been hospitalized um, uh, with, uh, within the past uh, six months. And uh, they uh, had had class four. They weren't uh, all in class four at the time of randomization, because you can't stay in class four very long. You either get better uh, with uh, treatment or not, but they, but that was a requirement. They were very sick. They, the mean ejection fraction was 30%. Uh, and um, it was a small trial involving only 335 patients. Um, there's very little information. There had been very little information about how Sokubitril Valsartan does in very sick patients. And uh, uh, so that was an area that we thought we would try to provide some additional information. And uh, the trial was truly absolutely negative. It was no benefit. The endpoint in that trial, uh, it wasn't sized for clinical endpoints, but the endpoint mm -hmm. was a uh, 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 change in uh, anti-proB and P, which often is a uh, marker for, uh, for clinical endpoints. And uh, uh, our, the comparison in this trial was not with uh, an ACE inhibitor, but it was with Valsartan. So the two arms were Valsartan versus Sacubitril Valsartan. And, um, uh, and neither had a marked effect, interestingly. Mm -hmm. Now, this trial differed in another way from the um, Paradise trial in that um, uh, uh, we gave a three to six day run-in period with the lowest dose uh, of Sucubitril Valsartan because we didn't want to uh, introduce the drug to these very sick people if they couldn't tolerate it for a mm -hmm. long time. And we found, interestingly enough, that of these patients, 18% couldn't tolerate the uh, run-in. And uh, um, the, the um, Clinical endpoints, uh, small number, and certainly not um, powered for that, showed uh, no benefit whatsoever. If anything, there was a trend that Alsartan was superior, but that was very small, and I wouldn't draw any conclusions. The thing in my mind is, well, okay, you have a very small trial, can you... Uh, extend that at all, I would be very surprised if, um, uh, if a larger trial showed a marked benefit. Mm -hmm. uh, we saw uh, nothing, if anything, it went in the wrong direction. Uh, but um, um, uh, I think that these are patients who probably uh, uh, require um, a either transplantation if they're suitable or uh, uh, left ventricular assisted eyes. 
Right, or supportive palliative care for those that don't qualify. So on balance, what we've learned through the trials, many of which you've been so pivotally uh, involved with and, and have led so remarkably well, is neprilysin inhibition is effective in stable ambulatory patients with heart failure reduced ejection fraction. The time to start therapy is sooner then later, do not wait till a patient has advanced symptoms. Neprilysin inhibition may also offer benefit in the peri-MI uh, phase. Uh, no statistically significant reduction in the primary composite endpoint of cardiovascular death or worsening heart failure, but a numeric benefit and evidence of safety. And from the pioneer trial that it is safe to initiate therapy in patients who have decompensated heart failure outside the MI setting. So um, if we take the whole picture together, we have this uh, core group that was studied in paradigm, um, uh, chronic heart failure, ambulatory, uh, very positive. Uh, we have a group studied in pioneer, um, uh, patients with acute decompensated heart failure, uh, but getting better. Um, having been stabilized, but having been hospitalized for heart failure um, and uh, showing a marked benefit. Uh, then we have a group of patients with acute myocardial infarction um, uh, with a moderate uh, uh, degree of uh, uh, reduction of uh, 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 ejection fraction. Uh, and uh, these patients show a numeric improvement. And if you look at total events, there is a significant improvement. And then you have the patients who are in class four or who have experienced class four in a trial that is much smaller and, 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 and uh, not as powerful as the others, showing absolutely no benefit. Thank you so much for your time with us today, Dr. Braunwald. It was our honor to have you. We hope to have you back again so we can have more enriching discussions and learn from your experience. Thank you so much. Nice to speak with you.